Did you know that at one point, this man controlled over 90% of the entire world's drug market? Imagine being so influential that almost every tab of LSD circulating on this planet had your fingerprints etched onto it. But how did he accomplish such an incredible feat? And what led to his downfall? Does power inevitably corrupt? Or was there something more sinister at play? Keep watching until the end as we unravel the gripping story behind the rise and fall of LSD King, William Pickard. Be prepared for unexpected twists and turns that will surely make you question everything you thought you knew about the war on drugs. Roots of genius and privilege. William Leonard Pickard wasn't your typical poor guy in the hood. He was born on October 1945 to wealthy parents. The Pickards were residing in the northwest suburbs of the city. His father, William, practiced civil law. His mother, Lucille, a Columbia University PhD, researched fungal diseases at the Centers for Disease Control. The Pickard family lived comfortably in a social and church-oriented neighborhood, surrounded by other academic families. As a child, William Leonard Pickard experienced many moments of joy and happiness. His parents were deeply entrenched in the world of science, and their home often welcomed visiting scientists from around the globe. In this nurturing environment, Pickard thrived and displayed an early aptitude for science. He was, in essence, a science prodigy. In the summer of 1962, Pickard's passion for science led him to intern at the prestigious Argonne National Laboratory in Illinois. The experience further fueled his intellectual curiosity and set the stage for a promising future. Just a year later, at the tender age of 17, Pickard achieved a remarkable feat. He emerged as one of the winners of the Westinghouse Talent Search. This accolade placed him among the top 40 science students in the entire United States, garnering him a staggering 22 scholarship offers. Among the various options presented to him, Pickard chose to attend Princeton University. The prestigious institution welcomed him with open arms, and it seemed that a bright and successful future awaited the young prodigy. However, the trajectory of his life would take an unexpected turn, leaving many to wonder about the events that led to his involvement in crime. What could have pushed a brilliant and promising young man into a life of crime? The answer remains elusive, shrouded in mystery. Was it the pressures of academia, personal struggles, or some unforeseen circumstances that led him down this path? To uncover the truth, we invite you to subscribe to our YouTube channel, hit the notification bell, and together, let us peel back the layers of Pickard's life, exploring the mysteries that lie beneath. Jazz clubs and nomadic pursuits. The allure of Greenwich Village's jazz clubs a mere train ride away from Princeton, proved too enticing for William Leonard Pickard. Less than a year into his Princeton journey, he found himself seduced by the vibrant scenes of music and culture, leading him to make a fateful decision. He dropped out, admitting, I wasn't as smart as I thought I was. With the safety net of his trust fund beneath him, Pickard embarked on a quest for a more profound understanding of the human experience than a traditional academic path could offer. The road, however, was not paved with enlightenment alone. In the mid-1960s, trouble seemed to trail Pickard wherever he went. At just 18 years old, fresh from the hallowed halls of Princeton, he faced legal woes in Alabama, twice arrested in 1964 for forging checks, and then again in January of the following year for the theft of a car. Pickard's early adulthood was marked by a series of run-ins with the law. Undeterred by his legal entanglements, Pickard embraced a nomadic existence, wandering the country in search of a deeper connection with life. For approximately seven years, he lived as a psychedelic free spirit, finding refuge in a commune in Austin, Texas. It was a time characterized by naked moonlight swimming, endless campfires, and theology in the High Sierra, as Pickard himself reminisced. The vast deserts became his canvas for refining the soul and discerning true value in the world all the while navigating the complexities of interpersonal conduct. From science to illicit chemistry. In 1974, Pickard formally returned to school, enrolling at Foothill College in Los Altos Hills, California, with a focus on biology and chemistry. His academic pursuits continued at San Jose State from 1976 to 1978, where he delved into the realms of organic chemistry and neurophysiology. Yet, it was during his early 30s that Pickard seemed to discover his calling. 
one that would intertwine his knowledge of chemistry with a newfound passion, cooking illegal drugs. The first compound he experimented with was MDMA, a drug few had even heard of at the time, but now known as ecstasy. To get around the fact that it was illegal, Pickard fiddled with the formula and came up with a chemical cousin, MDA, a somewhat trippier version of the drug. As Pickard continued his chemical endeavors, his Redwood City neighbors began to notice peculiar odors emanating from his apartment. Concerned citizens reported the issue, leading sheriff's deputies to knock on his door on October 10, 1977. What they discovered was beyond their expectations, a fully functional drug lab nestled in the basement of Pickard's residence. When confronted, Pickard employed a novel defense, claiming he was manufacturing an analog, a chemical variant with altered properties. However, this analog argument failed to shield Pickard from the consequences of his actions. In 1978, while attending chemistry classes at Stanford, he was found guilty of attempting to manufacture a controlled substance, a felony. He received a three-year sentence but served only 18 months behind bars. Astonishingly, incarceration did little to dampen his fascination with clandestine chemistry. In February 1980, shortly after his release, Pickard found himself in trouble again. Police in Gainesville, Georgia arrested him for manufacturing amphetamines. A few months later, in June, authorities in DeLand, Florida pinched him for distributing MDA, the ecstasy analog. No threat of imprisonment, it seemed, could interfere with Leonard's quest to liberate the collective mind. By 1987, Pickard had taken his clandestine activities to a new level, setting up an LSD lab in Mountain View. Within a year, by 1988, the operation was fully operational. The lab was contained inside a trailer, of the type you might see at a construction site, that had been dragged into a warehouse in an industrial section of the city. It contained state-of-the-art lab equipment, including a rotary evaporator, heating mantles, and a pill press, an item that DEA restrictions make almost impossible to obtain. Boxes of blotter paper adorned with a mesmerizing array of designs covered the floor. Escher heads, album covers, samurai shields, and black and white tropical scenes were meticulously arranged, serving as the canvas for a new drug substance that Leonard Pickard was manufacturing, lysergic acid diethylamid, LSD. In its purest form, LSD manifests as a white, odorless liquid with a faintly bitter taste, but its street presence often takes the form of drops dried onto blotting paper. The blotter paper, divided into small squares and adorned with captivating designs such as smiley faces and love shapes, became a canvas for a psychedelic experience. LSD, also known as acid, tabs, microdots, dots, window panes, or mellow yellow in popular culture, held the power to reshape perceptions and alter the way individuals experience the world. It could be sold in tablets, capsules, or dissolved into liquid marketed as breath fresheners, applied to various products like gum, candy, cookies, or sugar cubes. Leonard Pickard, with his keen understanding of chemistry and a taste for the illicit, turned this mind-altering substance into a lucrative business. He catered to distributors who, in turn, flooded the streets with his manufactured drugs. The profits rolled in as the demand for LSD surged within a counterculture, seeking new realms of experience. This substance, capable of inducing profound shifts in mood, senses, and attention, was believed to primarily affect serotonin in the brain, a chemical intricately linked to feelings of satisfaction, happiness, and optimism. To avoid another arrest, Pickard never stayed in one area for more than a few years. In the 1990s, he moved his lab numerous times. Throughout the 1990s, he shifted his clandestine lab multiple times, navigating the vast expanse of the United States. Originating in Oregon, he subsequently relocated to Aspen, Colorado, and later settled in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Pickard implemented meticulous precautions to safeguard his operation. He insisted distributors exchange large bills, never hoarded substantial sums of money, and maintained absolute secrecy regarding the lab's location. Products were either mailed directly to customers or picked up in nearby cities, ensuring a veil of anonymity, betrayal, chase, and infamy. However, a dark turn loomed on the horizon, spelling Pickard's ultimate downfall. In the tight-knit psychedelic community, enthusiasts gathered regularly to discuss new drugs, share research findings, and engage in conversations about Native American art. 
One such gathering, focused on the study of psychedelic mushrooms, took place in 1997. It was here that Pickard and his partner, Clyde Apperson, encountered Gordon Todd Skinner, a man who left an indelible impression with his generosity, intelligence, humor, and charm. Little did Pickard and Apperson know, Skinner was working undercover for the DEA. The unsuspecting trio collaborated closely, unaware of the betrayal that loomed in the shadows. The climax of this intricate drama unfolded in 2000, leading to Pickard's infamous arrest. During a period when Pickard and Apperson were out of town, Skinner executed a treacherous move, relocating the lab from its original site near the Atlas E missile silo in Kansas. Upon their return, the trio, unknowingly compromised by Skinner's cooperation with the DEA, initiated plans to move the remainder of the operation to its new location. The stage was set for a dramatic and fateful culmination of Pickard's clandestine career, one that would see the dismantling of his operation and the end of an era in the world of illicit drug production. While Pickard was gone, federal agents were given inside information by their informant, none other than Gordon Todd Skinner. Skinner let the DEA into the lab to look for evidence used to secure a search warrant, which a federal judge signed before Pickard had returned back to the silo site a few days later. Pickard and Apperson began moving the lab from the silo site in two vehicles. Apperson, who was paid a handsome sum to put up and tear down the lab during moves, drove a rider rental truck. Pickard drove the Buick LeSabre. Kansas Highway Patrol was enlisted by the DEA to pull them over to avoid suspicion, but the men immediately knew something was wrong. Though Apperson was quickly captured, Pickard scampered off into the night, sprinting across snowy ground into the woods, two highway patrolmen half his age in hot pursuit, a chase that was eventually joined by DEA agents, helicopters with infrared scanners and tracking dogs. As a marathon runner, Pickard eluded them for nearly 18 hours before deputies from the Pottawatomie County Sheriff's Office brought him in. Upon apprehension, Pickard's wallet, discovered at a convenience store in Wamigo, revealed a trove of false identities and cards, including a MasterCard under one of his aliases, James Maxwell, three false identification cards, a UCLA business card in his real name, and 11 telephone calling cards. The subsequent trial unveiled the staggering scale of Pickard's operation. The lab had been producing nearly a kilogram of LSD every five weeks, valued at approximately $40 million on the street. Pickard, however, maintained that he only sold to wholesalers, thereby disputing the street value and attempting to mitigate the severity of the charges against him. The Trial of William Leonard Pickard Pickard and Apperson were found guilty of conspiring to manufacture, distribute, and dispense 10 grams or more of LSD. A person received a 30-year sentence, and Pickard was given two life sentences. Pickard was transferred to the U.S. Penitentiary at Tucson, Arizona soon after. While in prison, Pickard returned to his academic endeavors. He learned about civil liberties, the justice system, and about other drugs. He also taught a fellow inmate how to read and published his own book, The Rose of Paracelsus. In later interviews and written work, Pickard argued against the belief that the end of his operation was the single reason there was a drop in LSD sales. He argued that the drug was on the decline already because of the demand for MDMA and other drugs, and that LSD sales had never had a centralized operation. On July 27, 2020, the chapter of Pickard's life behind bars came to an unexpected end. His advanced age and health issues made him especially vulnerable to COVID-19. The court, recognizing these risk factors, offered him a compassionate release. Notably, it wasn't just Pickard who found freedom in this manner. A person too was let go after serving his allocated time. Today, William Leonard Pickard is a free man who dedicates his time researching and penning down his insights on psychedelics. Despite being tagged as the acid king, he does not seem keen on clearing his infamous image. On the other hand, Klaas Bruinsma's story presents a stark contrast. Born into wealth and privilege, he chose a path of crime that led him into becoming one of Netherlands' most notorious kingpins. Curious about how Bruinsma went from riches to criminal infamy? Click on this suggested video to find out.